If you have a copy of God's Word with you today, would you please turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, and today we'll finish out the end of Romans chapter 3. And our pastor is away for some much-deserved, well-deserved uh, rest and relaxa relaxation on vacation today. So as you think of it, be praying uh, for him. And always a joy for me to, me to be able to share this time uh, with you in the Word. Also just want to encourage you as Christians, as followers of Christ, we are very thankful for the freedoms that this country affords us. Be able to sit in this room and to open our Bibles without any fear, uh, to be able to speak the gospel. It's, it's a great gift in our country with great freedom. We can share the gospel with those we are around. So very thankful as you celebrate this week, celebrate the freedoms you have as Christians in this great nation. Now, if you have your copy open to Romans 3, I want to give you a little bit of a preface before we read it. This text, uh, Paul is using a question and answer kind of format. So he asks a question and then he answers the questions and it breaks off into really three different major questions. And so therefore, guess what I'll have? Three points to the sermon, right? So give you a little bit of a, a preview of what's coming. But if you have your copy of God's word uh, open, would you please stand in honor of the reading of his word? And we'll begin reading there in Romans 3 and verse 27. And then we'll work our way all the way down to the end of the chapter. And the word of God says, Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law and by a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only, or is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today to ask for the spiritual eyes to be able to see your word, understand your word, and Lord, we ask for your eyes to be able to see our own hearts and to see the gospel. And Lord, we pray that for those here today that are trusting in something other than Christ alone for their salvation, that you would open their spiritual eyes today so they might see the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Since the text is full of questions today, I'd like to start with a question of my own. One in which has caused quite a bit of thought in the Christian life and one in which you may think about fairly often. What part of a person's actions, what I mean by actions are their works, their good deeds, their right and wrong acts. What part of a person's actions play, do, what part of a person's actions plays a role in their salvation? So how do your works interact with any part of you being saved? You say, well, I, I've been around church, Mike, and I know you're saved by grace. You, your works aren't part of your salvation, right? So, so what do you mean by this question? Th that's all right. But we all know people that have professed faith in Christ. They prayed a prayer. They maybe walked an aisle. Maybe they got baptized. And then shortly after their decision, their life went everything apart from the church. We know there was a decision at one point in time, and maybe now for 20, 30, 40 years, we've watched them live everything apart from anything to do with Jesus. And so in our minds, we wonder, is that person a believer? Even if you talk to them, they would claim to be a Christian. 
Oftentimes, these are the hardest people to talk to. You don't, you don't know whether to share the gospel with them or tell them to come to church. And is this person actually a believer? Maybe you pray for them, their family members. Anybody have people like this in their life? People that you knew, I think back to people I knew in high school, people I grew up with in church. And I wonder, are they genuine believers? So what part do our actions or our works play in our salvation? Well, this text today helps answer that full picture. And it's going to take the whole time for us to get there. Uh, but I want to start with one core truth and we'll work our way out. So the central theme today, the main idea, is that the Lord is central in every part of our salvation. The Lord is central. He, is, he plays a role, the main role, in every part of our salvation. So let me give you the first point if you're taking notes. You are saved by faith alone. You are saved by faith alone. Paul begins this idea by asking a question. Remember, I mentioned the three questions. Here's the first one. And if you notice, even there, he's going to ask three in a row, but all are asking the same thing. Look at it there in verse 27. He said, then, he says, then what becomes of our boasting? What becomes of of our boasting. So let's break it down a little bit. Who's our? Paul is speaking particularly about a group of people because if you've, if you've been walking through with us in Romans in two and three, he's been talking about those that are Jewish, those that are Jews. And in the time, they're talking about whether it's an advantage or not an advantage or what may a Jew boast about that other people might not. There are several things they might boast on. Jews might boast on their nationality. If you look at the Old Testament, Jews are God's chosen people. There's a sense at which if you were a Jew at this time, you would think I am a part of a group of people that God particularly has chosen. Even press it even further, you might say that he's a part of a family that comes from God's chosen people. You might have, if you were a Jew, you would have traced your lineage to be able to look back through your family and be able to see where you have history there. A third way which a Jew might boast is their religious background. They grew up at the temple, they knew scriptures, they memorized things, that's a part of their life. And the final way, not just everything in the past, the final way a Jew might boast would be in their current attempt to keep the law. They were striving to do all the things they believed the Bible was asking them to do. So Paul asked the question, what becomes of your boasting in these areas? And he answers the question. He says, it is excluded. You see it there in the text? He says, it's wiped off. You cannot boast in these things. Paul had these things. When he says our, he's talking about himself. Meaning that he was somebody who could boast. Let me explain it a little bit further. Look at uh, I want to read just a few verses from Philippians chapter 3, where Paul talks about the things he could boast in in regard to this. Philippians 3 verse 4 says this, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. If that's not boasting, I don't know what is, right? He says, I've got the most. Listen to how he outlines it. It's going to go through all the list I just went through. I'll point them out. Verse 5, he says, circumcised on the eighth day. He said, I grew up at the temple. Then he says, um, I, he says, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel. He said, I'm a part of God's chosen people. He presses it further. Of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He says, you don't understand. My family has history here. Then he speaks about his own personal righteousness. He says, as to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. And as to righteousness under the law, blameless. So Paul says, let me tell you my list of things that I could boast in. Now, let me, let me describe here for a second. These are advantages. They are not credits. Here's what I mean. The study guide doesn't allow you to ace the test. 
Just because you have a great study guide, it doesn't give you a grade. Just because they knew the Bible didn't mean that before God, they were made righteous. They couldn't boast in these things because, and here he's going to explain in verse 27. Look at it again. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded by what kind of law? The word law here, you probably should take more like a principle. He says, what kind of principle? By a principle of works, a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Okay, so why is it that I can't boast in these things? It's because of the law or the principle of faith. So what is that? Let's get to verse 28. Because verse 28 might be the pinnacle verse of this entire passage. It's one you should know. He says, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. See, this is why none of that is worth boasting. Because your justification before God is done apart from anything you do. This is mind-blowing if, if you think about it. That before God, what justifies you and makes you right with him is actually, actually has nothing to do with what you do. Notice the words there. The first one is justified. Justification means that you are declared righteous. In other words, you're not made perfect. God just calls you righteous. It is done by faith. Faith is the vehicle by which this happened. Not by your works. It is by your faith, and it's done apart from works of the law. Just to make it clear, he wants to let you know you have no room for boasting because your justification before God has nothing to do with your works. This is the gospel, right? We are justified apart from this. Now, let's turn, okay? We've, if up to this point, I've tried to teach you the Bible. Let's turn and talk about us for a minute. I bet in this room, since we're particularly talking about people that were Jewish in background and coming to faith in Christ, if we were to work across the room, that is a small minority of this room. So how is it that this relates to us? I believe we can find some commonalities to ways they might have boasted, to ways that we could boast. Let me start with nationality. It's tempting in America, the way our country is, that there's a large portion of Christians in America. I mean, at least uh, the numbers go up to 70 or 80 percent of people in America will identify as a Christian. So it's easy to begin to believe that if you're American, you're automatically Christian. Let me press it a little bit further. Maybe you grew up in a family. Uh, you went to church. Your mom went to church. Your dad went to church. Your grandfather went to church. Y your, your upbringing, your family, all all were there, and you say, because I'm a part of this Christian family, naturally you begin to think of yourself as a Christian. Even beyond that, you grew up in church. Maybe you're one of those. When you were born, you were, went right from the hospital right to the nursery at church. You were there every single Sunday. You were there every single week. And you begin to think, I grew up in church, so therefore I'm a Christian. I'll press it one step further. Maybe today, right now, you come to church every single Sunday. You sit in a seat every single week. You faithfully give to the church. You sit, you, you may even teach a Sunday school class or serve in Awana. You may sing in the choir. You may serve in different capacities in the church. While all of those things are wonderful things, here's Paul's point. That if you are trusting in any of those things to make you right and justified with God, you have placed your trust in the wrong place. You have put your faith to be justified in the wrong spot because you are justified before God by faith apart from any work that you do. Jesus is both the just and the justifier. So let me illustrate this for a moment. It's summertime, plenty hot enough outside, right? You're starting to feel it. And it's time to go to the pool. I enjoy going to the pool. My, uh, I grew up, I didn't have a pool in my neighborhood. We didn't go very often. I got a pool in my neighborhood now. I like going. So me and the kids will typically go to the pool fairly often. Well, my four-year-old Kate cannot swim yet. So she's got one of those little floaties. 
Everybody familiar with the floaty? They stick around the arms and she, you put that thing on her and it's like she can swim. She goes around the pool. She can go wherever she wants to. She's able to make it wherever she wants in the pool. Also, if she's standing on the side, sometimes she doesn't want to wear that floaty, but they got these steps going in the pool. She can take the floaty off. She can kind of stand on two or three steps. And so eventually, after a little bit, wearing that floaty around, standing on those steps, she starts to believe that because of those advantages, she starts to believe she can swim. So we're standing there in the pool, and the other day, this is just a couple weeks ago, we've got, I'm sitting there by her. I wouldn't let her on the steps without me being there. And so I'm standing there, and she took her, took her floaty off. She's standing on the second step, and she's got a ball, and we're just kind of tossing it back and forth. Well, you know, what happens with the ball, it kind of tosses it, it drifts out a little bit, she takes a step down, takes another step down, and then there it goes, right? We, because of our sinfulness, we cannot stand before the wrath of God. All of us cannot swim. And if you think any of these advantages in your life is makes you able to stand and to be able to swim and to stand before a holy God, they don't. But one day when you stand before a holy God and you step off of that step, you better hope you put your faith and trust in somebody else. Because when that moment comes, you better hope, just like with Kate, Jesus steps right up under you, lifts you back up out of that water and makes you new. Because you can't save yourself, only Jesus can. It's by faith alone. Now, I only read you half of the passage earlier, where Philippians 3, where Paul listed out his accomplishments. Let me show you the second half here. Verse 7, he said, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss. He saw it as a loss. He said, for the sake of Christ, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss. All these things he thought were great, they're actually a loss to him. And he looks at them, look at what he says, all things of all these things, and I count them as rubbish or as trash. He began to see all the things he thought would have earned him favor to God actually were what kept him from him. But now he sees them as trash in order that he, what, may gain Christ, be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, you can't swim, that comes from this law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Don't substitute all the advantages and gifts of God in your life to make you start thinking that you can boast in your own righteousness because it is simply by faith alone in Jesus that you are saved. You cannot save yourself. So let me ask one direct question and I'll move on. What are you trusting in today to justify you one day before God? What is it that you are trusting in today, right now, to justify you before a holy God? So you're not only saved by faith alone, but you're also saved by Jesus alone. So if you're taking notes, the second point is you are saved by Jesus alone. There's a second big question that Paul wants to ask us. He asks in verse 29, or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? You see the question there? Is he, is he just for a certain group of people? Just for God's chosen people? In other words, are we dealing with a religion that is only for part of the world? Now, when we say Jews and Gentiles, what we mean is our Jews are descendants of Jacob or Israel, people that are a part of the people of God, as we would say from the Old Testament, but Israelites. And then everybody else is a Gentile. So if we say Jews and Gentiles, what we mean is every single other person on the planet. So the Bible's saying, is he just the God for a certain group of people, or is he the God for everybody? And he does a unique thing in verse 30. He actually uses a phrase that a Jew in the first century would know really well. Look at verse 30. 
Maybe if you know your Bible, you'll hear it as I read it. Just the first phrase. He says, since God is one. Since God is one. Think about your Old Testament. Start rolling back around. You start thinking, what is it that you would, people would have memorized so much of? And you might go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's known as the Shema that they would have gone over and over again. And listen to the phrase here. I'll just read verse 4 to you. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There is only one God. Meaning that God is the God of the entire planet, not just for a certain group of people. Now this is, you say, okay, yeah, yeah, I've been in church a long time, but this is a tempting belief in the modern era. To say, well, if you're Muslim or you're Hindu or you're Buddhist, or even if you're just a good guy, anything, if you're sincere in that belief, then that's okay. It's the belief that if you choose a religion and that's the way you go, then that's a fine way to go. And, and the biggest thing is now you don't want to tell anybody what they're saying is wrong. Well, Jesus says in John 14, 6, a very clear statement. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So let me make this crystal clear in this moment. Since God is the God of all people, that means that all other faiths and religions are false. They're not true. We call this the exclusivity of the gospel. We're meaning the gospel, and when we say exclusive, we don't mean in the sense of like an exclusive club. In a sense, everybody, it's in a broad way, the gospel is for everyone to be invited. But in a sense of how it's actually applied, how people are saved is narrow just through Jesus. This is the exclusivity of the gospel. It's defined this way. Jason Allen put it, only those who personally, consciously, explicitly, and singularly confess Jesus Christ as Lord can possess eternal life. That's it. Just through Jesus. Now this is a hopeful reality because that means every single person on the planet has the exact same hope of just placing their faith in Jesus. Notice what verse 30 says. Since God is one, look how he explains it. Who will justify, and look, he says two groups. He's going to justify the circumcised by faith, and he's going to justify the uncircumcised through faith. Jew and Gentile approach Jesus the exact same way. So no matter what religion, no matter where a person comes from, when they come to accept Christ, they, you only have one step you call on them to make. Place your faith in the Lord Jesus. That's what we call people to do. This also comes with a fairly sobering reality. If the gospel is ex exclusive, then people who follow all of these other religions face a terrible destiny. So you know why we talk about praying for your one before the service? Jacob mentioned praying for one person you will see come to faith in Christ. Do you want to know why we give money to send missionaries all over the world? Do you want to know why our prayer is and our hope is that you go out and share the gospel with your loved ones and those you're around? It's because we believe Jesus is the only way. And it's easy, just to press on you a little bit with this, it's easy to begin to think, you know, that, that neighbor of mine, I know he's Muslim and he seems happy, so I'm just going to leave him alone. It, it'll probably be okay. It's easy, I know in reality you might affirm what I just said, like you, you may say you believe that, but when it comes down to day to day, do you actually believe that Jesus is the only hope for your loved ones, your friends, your coworkers, and your neighbors? This is the exclusivity of the gospel. He's not just the God for just Hickory Grove and us. And then there's other people in Charlotte that get other gods that they can worship. 
There is only one way. Now, I have a natural question that follows all of this. So if everybody approaches by faith, what actually happens to works? I started this way. I know I build the question up at the beginning, right? I ask, what role do works play in our salvation? And so far, I've thrown them out the whole time. Right? The Bible said it's by faith alone. It's, it has completely thrown works to the side, and Paul is feeling this. And so I want to show you the third thing in the text, and really this last verse. You are saved to obey God alone. The first two deal with our approach to God. But then once we are saved, what comes after it? Paul's anticipated the natural question, if everything is by grace, why bother doing anything good? If you're in school, teacher comes in and says, no test. You say, no study, right? <laughs> Who's studying for a test you don't have to take? So if in your mind you think one day Jesus is going to take your test, why do I have to bother living a holy life? So the natural question is, do we just throw out the whole law? Well, funny you think of it because Paul asked it. Look at verse 31. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? Right? Do we, do we just chunk the whole law out? It's a natural thought we might have. So let me talk before I answer it. I want to conclude by answering it. I want to talk for a moment back to what we started on, is, is what I might refer to as a false conversion, or somebody coming to faith that actually didn't come to faith, somebody that looked that way. You all know people like this. I mentioned it earlier, that have walked an aisle or prayed a prayer. But it, it rings true when you think of Jesus' parable, when he speaks about the seed that fell on the road, and some fell on the hard ground, and some got trampled, and some had thorns and stuff grew up around it. And what's interesting is they may show a little bit, but eventually that seed never takes root. And there's finally a fourth seed that Jesus speaks about that grows and flourishes. Three of the seeds are not believers. One is. Here's the point, is that many of us know people, and the term I'll give here we've used it fairly often, is the idea of a backslidden Christian. Somebody who backslides. Now, I understand a Christian might struggle in life, but what I'm talking about are the times when we have somebody who 20, 30 years ago came to church, made the profession of faith, and for a considerable amount of time, we've watched them live completely against God's law. There's no sort of marking in their life. There's no sort of point in their life where you could point and say, that person bears the marks of Christ. And so then we begin to ask, is this person actually a Christian? Because here's the temptation. If on the front end, none of my works matter, then we want to take the back end and say, well, none of the works matter on the back end either. But the problem is the Bible doesn't always see it that way. The Bible says that those who come to faith actually uphold the law. Look at verse 31. Do we then overthrow this law by faith? He says, by no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Now, I'd say there's about three levels this is upheld. First is Jesus' holy, righteous life fulfills the law. I think the law is still upheld when you, before faith, learn about your sinfulness from the law and that drives you to Christ. But then I think this final way the law is upheld is that when you come to faith in Christ, you then begin to become more like Christ. You begin to pursue holiness. That's what Christians do. They pursue holiness. Now, uh, I mentioned earlier this verse 28, the faith alone verse when it says faith apart from works. Martin Luther, when he was a part of the Reformation and rediscovering the gospel for the Protestant church, when he was doing that, he came to this 
passage and in verse 28, that's when he said faith apart from works is when he got the idea really of faith alone. And so he starts thinking, well, if faith is alone, he starts struggling with, okay, well then what role does any sort of pursuit of holiness matter? So Luther famously said this. He said, we are saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. We're saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is actually never alone. Meaning that when you come up to faith in Christ, there is no work that puts you into that moment when you become a Christian and your heart is made new and you are saved and all the way up to that point. But after that, the Holy Spirit begins a work in your life and you begin to, as this text says, uphold the law. That's where verses like 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 says, And by this we know that we have come to know him. Notice it's past tense, right? We have come to know him. Why? If we keep his commandments. I, I'm not saying you're perfect. In fact, if you read 1 John, he says, If you say you're perfect, you're a liar, right? We're not perfect people. But what I am saying is there's a marked radical difference in the life of a believer after they come to faith in Christ. And that's the role works plays. Oftentimes we get confused. We know works don't save you, but then after that we start to wonder, is this person actually a Christian? Is this person a follower of Christ? Now ultimately, I don't know a person's heart. I, I can't. If somebody says they're a Christian, I can't peer into their heart and tell if they are. However, if you're here today, and even if you look back way in your past, and you say, I came to faith in Christ, and I've had a long period of time, maybe you're here with your family, maybe you're visiting here today, and you say, I've had this long period of time, I haven't been walking with God. Well, the answer today is not just go out and try harder. The answer today is to go all the way back to that decision and figure out if you ever actually were trusting in Christ to start with. Did you actually believe on the Lord Jesus? So throw yourself on his mercy today. Be careful. Now, I know where I'm stepping here, so this is, tough sub this is a tough subject. Because we all have family members that we wrestle with because a long time ago, we know that they made this particular decision. And we know it was by faith, so can't judge them, right? But then we've looked since then, and there's no sort of fruit that marks their life. Here's what I would say to you. Be careful to rest too much on that one decision a long time ago. It, it's easy to just say, well, I think they were a Christian from a long time ago. You need to go to that person. You need to talk to that person. You need to challenge them about who they're trusting in and to challenge whether this is actually taking root. If you're here and you're not sure where you're at, you're not sure of another person you know, you need to be praying for that person. We talk about who's your one. You should be daily praying for some of these people in your life that you know are in a spot. You don't know if they're a Christian. And if you had to guess, you'd be like, I don't have enough fruit to be able to substantiate it. And then finally, I want to end with a question and then we'll pray. But I want to ask you this question. And it's the question of the whole morning long. Who are you trusting to make you righteous before a holy God? Who? What are you trusting? Are you trusting that you've piled up enough things that when you stand before God, you'll go, God, look at all my stuff. I've been to church a whole lot. I've taught a lot of Sunday school. I've been faithful. I've been trying to do all this. God, will you take me because I've been so good? Or will one day when you stand before God and he says, why should I let you into heaven? You'll go, I, I know I'm a sinner, but let me point you to my Savior. And you'll look to the Lord Jesus 
Christ because he is where your righteousness is found. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. As we do that, I want to offer an invitation for you today. A couple of different ways. First of all, if you're here and you know, you know you're not a Christian. Or maybe you're just not sure. You've been living far enough away from the Lord, you don't have enough fruit in your life right now to be able to tell. When we, when we end our service, when we sing here in just a moment, there'll be pastors at the end of each aisle. There's trained leaders down here, down front. They, they've talked to a whole lot of people. We as pastors have talked to a whole lot of people that are not sure of their salvation. That's a normal question. We're down here and we're in the lobby after the service to talk to you. If you want somebody to pray with or to speak to you about your salvation, today's the day. Again, all it takes is one step, faith in Jesus, right now. You don't have to line up a bunch of things for him to take you. Just one thing, faith in the Lord Jesus. Let me offer a second invitation to you today. I believe every person in here that's a Christian knows somebody in their life that fits this bill. Family member, loved one, whoever it might be. I want to open it up if you need to in your seat or if you want to come down here down front and, and, and get on the altar and just pray for them today. Beg the Lord to save them. Beg the Lord to do a work in their heart and their life so that they might see Jesus to be the one to save them. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this great hope of the gospel. And Lord, today, as we have these few moments, I pray that we would respond to your spirit as it speaks to us. We pray these things in Christ's name, amen. Would you please stand as we sing?